welcome. Everything is fine. You're listening to Fork and Bullshirt, the Good Place podcast. I'm Jason. And I'm Vivian. And we'll be the cackling demons in your afterlife. This week we're talking about Season 4, Episode 7, Help is Other People. This episode was written by Dave King, directed by Beth McCarthy Miller, and it aired November 7th, 2019. On the last day of the experiment, the team is throwing a party. Suspicious of the neighborhood, Simone has been gathering evidence to prove the good place isn't what it seems. I am positive something is truly forked up. Her suspicions are confirmed when John spills the tea about Jason. I know something and it's just graduated from hot goss to relevant AF. And Brent says he's going to the best place. So at midnight, I'm in the first Escalade out of here, baby. Tahani and Jason warn Eleanor and the team scrambles to think of a plan. Simone and Chidi investigate and find a suspicious whiteboard with emojis and pictures of themselves, Brent, and John. Why are there emojis? I mean, one of them's party hat guy. I mean, that's good, right? He's friendly. That's better than thermometer guy or angry cat or smiling poop coil. With hours to go, Michael creates a sinkhole in town square and Brent falls in. Ah! I'm not scared. I'm shouting so you know I'm okay. I am very brave. The team leaves behind the three other subjects, hoping they'll help Brent. Unable to proceed with conflicting philosophies, Simone and Chidi part ways. Simone and John leave while Chidi attempts to help Brent. He falls in and Eleanor improvises. In Eleanor's office, Chidi explains to Brent that they are in the bad place. You're not going to the best place! Don't you get it? They're torturing you. They're torturing all of us! Michael and Eleanor cackle with glee, confirm his suspicions, and leave. The clock hits zero, ending the experiment with Brent frozen mid-apology. And let's dive into the sinkhole of the episode. (laughs) Yeah, let's do that. (laughs) Oh, man. Okay. So before we get super into this episode, I want to talk about the title. So the title of the episode is Help is Other People, which is absolutely a play on words from the famous quote, Hell is Other People, um, from Sartre's 1944 existentialist French play, No Exit. Which we have talked about in the first couple episodes of this podcast. Yes, absolutely. A lot of people have made connections between The Good Place and No Exit um, because the story No Exit is really about three people stuck in a room that is hell. Um, And they're just torturing each other. There's no instruments. They're just torturing each other. So anyway, this quote, hell is other people, is often used to say that, you know, other people are the worst, like, oh, I can't stand being around other people. But it's actually a reference to Sartre's concept of the look from his book, Being and Nothingness. Okay, so it can be a bit of a tricky concept. So I'm going to give you an example. So imagine that you're sitting on a park bench and you're enjoying your lunch, you're having a good day, and there's an old man who's sitting on a bench nearby, you know, doing the same thing. But then suddenly, he's staring at you. How do you feel? Weird. Yeah, it's unnerving, right? Okay. And it's not, it's not because he's a threat physically. You don't think that he's going to harm you. It's just, he's staring at you. Because now... You're not suddenly by yourself in your own world. Somebody is uh, like invaded in your your personal space. Kind of. You recognize, in a sense, you recognize that there's another consciousness behind those eyes. There's another person there, uh, another point of view, one that you can't occupy because you're not that person. So you can't really relax because you're so aware that you're being watched. Right. You know, you're wondering, okay, does he approve of what you're doing? Is he suspicious about you? Does he think that I look funny? Do I have something on my face? Does he think I'm ugly? You just, you have no idea. The thing is, you're totally unsure, but now your world is infected by this guy's values, right? He gets to decide if you're ugly or if you're behaving strangely, or if you're a good person or not. He's just passing all this judgment on you. He projects his own values onto everything else Mm -hmm. and onto you, right? So Sartre felt that that look was always on you. Um, And when you feel that look on you, it separates you from the real you. 
because suddenly you see yourself as an object in someone else's world, right? You are acutely aware of being seen. Obviously, there's a lot more to this theory because, you know, philosophy is very complex, (laughs) but it applies to the good place as a whole, I think, um, because we're thinking, okay, other people are projecting their values onto us and they're judging us. And in the good place, it's completely explicit. It's the afterlife. The afterlife is judging all of us, every single one of our actions and deeming us good or bad. We're never without the look of the judge and the accountants, right? Right. Um, But when we think specifically about this episode, we can also kind of see that it can be a bit of a positive. Like oftentimes when we think of people judging us, we always think of it like negatively, you know, that person thinks I'm stupid or they think I'm ugly or they think I'm not good enough to date or whatever it is, right? But I think that other people's judgment and the sometimes shame that comes from that doesn't have to be a negative emotion. It can be a moral emotion. So like the judgment of others can teach us if we've done something wrong, can teach us if we've transgressed a rule or a norm of some kind. And shame can allow us to self-evaluate and to judge ourselves, right? So (laughs) when... Eleanor and Michael reveal that Brent is in the bad place and Chidi tells him he's a good per He's, uh, sorry, not a good person. Uh, and Chidi tells him that he's a bad person. Brent has never had anyone judge him that way before. Mm-hmm. No one has ever been direct with him to tell him, you are not behaving well. You are actually a bad person. So in that moment, I think is the first time that he feels maybe a sense of shame and a right a righteous, I guess, sense of shame. It's it's different than when earlier on in the previous episode, Chip Driver Mystery, um, when they tell him that he's being sexist and whatever. The situation is so different because yeah. it's just been revealed that they're in the bad place. So the consequences are like the real. They're not just saying this because they're bad people. They're Chidi is telling him this because they are legit in the bad place like they're going like he's gonna go to hell yeah and chidi is not saying i'm better than you or whatever they're Mm -hmm. both here they're both in the bad place both in the same situation yeah and chidi is of course telling him you know you never cared about anyone else and that is the minimum anyone asks of you and chidi is so completely right in that moment but at the same time they're in the same place They both ended up in the bad place. So I don't think Brent is thinking, oh, well, no, 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 no. You can't judge me. That's not fair. Mm -hmm. He's just suddenly realized, oh, everyone thinks I'm a bad person. Like, even God. I'm Mm -hmm. saying that with (laughs) quotation marks. There's no God in this show Mm -hmm. so far. (laughs) Um, But everyone thinks I'm a bad person. And it's, it's. A moment where he is actually forced to self-reflect, which is something Brent has never done in his life. So for me, the title of this episode is Help as Other People is like that look, that sense of unease, of sometimes shame that we get can also be helpful in understanding how to live in a community. Right. So Brent has been helped by other people. He just hasn't taken that help at all. Yeah. Like Simone says, like we've tried to help him a thousand times. Yeah. Over and over again. And of course, there's the, you know, moment of will they help him? Will they not help him? Of course, Chidi does help his other people. I get that. But I just really thought this was a really cool um, title for the episode. Honestly. Yeah. It works really well. Yeah. Um, It's interesting what you're talking about in regards to shame. I've been rewatching Big Mouth, the okay. Netflix show, which is great. I mean, it's hilarious and fun, but it's also really poignant in some... <laughs> when it's not being disgusting. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not unwarranted. It's like... Mm-hmm. So in season two, a big part of the storyline is shame mm-hmm. and how there's a shame wizard and he's making everybody feel shame for some things that they're doing. And near the end of the season everybody has no shame the shame wizard goes away and everyone's free to do whatever they want shame free and it just you can't live like that 
because you need something to tell you that this is wrong or I shouldn't be doing this or mm-hmm. I need to, I don't know, reevaluate the way I'm interacting with people, yeah. the way people uh, look at me and the way how the way I want to be looked at. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we kind of need to feel that shame every once in a while. Yeah, like, it keeps us in check, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's part of it is Brent hasn't felt any kind of shame. So he hasn't kept himself in check. He hasn't had to reflect on how he behaves, how he treats other people, mm-hmm. because regardless of how other people have responded, he personally has never felt any shame for his actions. Right. So I, I, I mean, I have, I have felt so much shame in my life and I'm not here to say that shame is a great thing. It's not. But societally, it can help. Yeah, right? and it can also <laughs> it has a It has a purpose, Absolutely. basically. Absolutely. <laughs> it can help and it can hurt. Yes. For sure. Um, so on the topic of, of no exit still, I like that this episode is taking that, uh, that famous quote and using it as their title because we also get some other similarities between the play and this episode. Um, In the play, two of the characters can accept that they're in hell. Um, They think that's just some kind of mistake. But then one character, the third, accepts what she did on Earth. She totally accepts her fate. And she's like, yep, I get it. I know why I'm here. I don't feel, you know, I'm not trying to um, weasel my way out of this or anything. I understand why I'm here. And I deserve it. Like Chidi. Yeah. And in this episode, exactly. Exactly. Chidi and Brent discover, kind of, that they're in the bad place, kind of, <laughs> um, but only Chidi is the one who accepts his fate. He understands that he's there because he drank too much almond milk, which that's not true, but in his mind it is. He's like, okay, this is what it is. I accept it. I'm not happy, but I get it. Mm-hmm. Whereas Brent is just, no, no, not possible. This is a good place. I was a good person you know, lying to himself. And as well, in No Exit, two characters really struggle to define themselves um, with this devouring gaze of the other, you know, the look that they're constantly, is constantly being imposed upon them. Um, So they struggle to create their own identity because they're relying on the opinions of other people to define them. Sartre called this bad faith because he believed that human beings don't possess any inherent Uh, identity or value so he felt that each person creates their own identities and their own values and determines meaning for their own lives he's an existentialist if you haven't figured it out (laughs) and because he felt that we have this ability to choose he feels that freedom comes with a total responsibility for your actions and both Chidi and Simone are creating their own identity and their own values and they're really Holding on to that in this episode. Neither of them are giving up that position. Yeah, they're and, definitely not budging. They're like, they're so stuck in their beliefs. Yeah, and I mean, that can be a bad thing. It can be a good thing, right? But I, as much as it's a funny moment when both of them say, I respect your position and that's like taken as a breakup. I like that because they're both taking responsibility for their own values, their own identities And they understand that they can't impose anything on the other person, that that other person deserves to be treated with respect as well. And they just, that's how they move on, right? They They both explain themselves as much as they can. And And of course, we have Chidi taking responsibility for his actions with the almond milk. And we have Brent refusing, even when faced with a, you know, the possibility of eternal damnation. He can't start to understand his responsibility. I mean, he might have started to understand that he's responsible for his actions when the clock hits zero and he starts to apologize, but we're not sure. Like, we get the I'm so, so sorry. We know he's starting to apologize. We get that. But what is he going to be apologizing for? Exactly. Is he saying, I'm sorry for being a jerk? I'm sorry I'm sorry I I made you fall in the hole? What is he saying? It seems like he's being sincere. I'm really hoping that at this point he is understanding that, you know, he has this freedom and with that freedom comes responsibility. 
with great power comes great responsibility, Sartre was close. <laughs> Good old Uncle Ben. <laughs> so, anyway, go and read No Exit. It's great. <laughs> yeah, that, that whole realization that Brent has at the end, like... When he just, he's, he gets up and he's like, no, I am a good person. And it's just, it's so, I'm so conflicted in that scene. I love it. it he's so genuine. Yeah. And he's so, he, it's almost close to tears for him. Like, Oh yeah, how, no, he's definitely getting a little misty. Yeah. And it's just, I feel so much pity for him. See, I feel pity for him a little bit, but at the same time, I don't want to. I know. That's why I'm conflicted. Is because I don't want this to be a show where I'm supposed to feel bad for him when he's been a total jerk to everybody in his whole life. I know, but I think that might be the lesson. Like, Yeah, people can change. Yeah. Not just that people can change, but people that have been sheltered from shame their entire life and Mm. always everything's just handed to them and there's been nothing in their life that's got them in put them in check like Mm. it's tough it is a really tough episode it well it's tough when you get to the end and you're not sure how they're gonna proceed you're not sure if brent has learned his lesson it's very tough Mm -hmm. and it's It kind of angers me because when you get to the end of the episode, I just feel like the experiment is potentially going to be ruined just because of Brent. Like if they had picked one other person. Well, I think that's part of the point as well for the (sighs) bad place, right? It's Sean really picked a doozy. He really did. He picked a very difficult person. Ugh. Okay. Yeah. That's a tough one. I just... I mean, it's pretty clear that Chidi can change and become a better person. We already know that. Simone is already a pretty good person. John wasn't super far off from changing and learning some lessons. And we see that he has changed. Like, mm-hmm. he's still a better person than he was before. It's not great. But he's but better. He's, better. he's shown improvement, for sure. He's shown that he could change and that he's tried to make some steps towards that. Sure. But then we have Brent. And we have so much of our efforts focused on Brent and the other people's behavior being judged through the lens of whether or not they want to help Brent, who's the worst. So can we talk about that for a second? Okay, yes, please. Wouldn't Simone be losing points along with John because of their lack of help for Brent? I'm on Chidi's side. I don't care who's in the hole. It doesn't matter. It's not about them. It's about you doing the right thing. It, it it really, really doesn't matter who's in the hole or what's in the hole. It's about doing the right thing. And it's just about helping mm-hmm. somebody who's in need. Like, if you're giving to the homeless or something like that. For example, you don't know their stories. You don't know what's happening, what's happened to them. They could be a horrible person could be based on circumstance it could be just they've always been a horrible person and they fought with their family they fought with the law whatever they fought everyone so that's why they're on the street but should you still try and give them a pair of socks because it's cold out yeah i mean that that certainly resonates with me i obviously i work with the the homeless population and sometimes you see people that do not have very great pasts and they have not been a very good person but that doesn't mean that you don't help them it doesn't mean that they don't deserve to have a roof over over their head and food in their belly and you know warm socks and clothes and you know everybody should have those basic rights absolutely i i agree that brent shouldn't be left to die or to suffer but at the same time i feel like it's not super fair of the show to put Simone in this position and not so much John because John doesn't care John has never been the person that well actually I shouldn't say that no that's not true John's gay so Brent has probably made fun of him in some way shape or form sure because if he's not homophobic I will be very surprised (laughs) um 
But we get someone like Simone who has been completely treated like garbage Mm -hmm. by Brent since the beginning of the show. Right. And I feel like it's kind of a crummy thing to say that she should give up her safety to help someone who would never help her and to help someone who has been given a thousand and one chances to be a good person. It It's just, it's hard. Like, I get the whole... Why is her safety at stake? Because she doesn't... None of them know what's going to happen when the clock is at zero, right? Right. They don't know what's going to happen. They don't know what's going to happen, so they don't know if by helping Brent, they're going to get stuck in the hole, like Chidi does. They don't know if um, helping him is going to mean that they can't escape mm-hmm. and that Brent's going to be left to, I don't know, uh, meet the fire squid that Michael really is. So what John <sighs> and Simone are doing is what Jason talked about running at the clock. Mm-hmm. Like they're just running and hoping it's going to work out for them. But they're trying something, though. They're not. They're, they're running. running. They're running away from the problem. Yeah. And like Jason said, it's always better to do something. And what they're doing isn't... I mean, is it really that likely that driving away in an Escalade is going to save you from eternal damnation? No, not really. Helping someone <laughs> is more likely to do that. <laughs> yeah, but they also don't know it, what this is. They don't right. even know if They don't know. It's, they're it's in a weird the situation. Place. Um. The best guess that Simone has is that they're in some kind of experiment, right? Mm -hmm. And from day one... And of course she nails it. (laughs) Yes, of course. Um, She always has to be right. Well, yes, it's also Simone and she's super smart and capable. Yes. Um, But I think for her, it's just, it's been since day one that she hasn't really felt comfortable with the entire idea of this. Mm -hmm. So for her, it's like, I don't know what's going on. I just, I can't be part of whatever this is i can't be lied to anymore i need to know what's happening and i think that probably bothers her so much is because she is used to being part of the experiment she's used to being the one running things right right? in control yes um she's used to being in control and i think for her to not be in control and to be the subject is terrifying. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, not knowing what's going to come next in the experiment, not knowing what the goal of this is, is terrifying. I just, I have a hard time with this. I really do. I I find it kind of a crappy thing to say that Simone should be, I don't know, giving up everything uh, to help someone like Brent. See, that's where I disagree because I don't see it as giving up everything. I just see it as someone's in need of help. Forget everything else that's going on. Just help them. I mean, it feels like the whole situation could have been solved in less time than it took for them to argue. The rope was like right there. (laughs) They could have just tossed it down and pulled them up in like, I don't know, 30 seconds. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, and maybe. maybe not, but I don't know. I, I guess I'm on Chidi's side. Yeah, I. it's like I know I'm on Chidi's side, but I'm just... Until you're in this situation. I'm a little uncomfortable tough. with what I feel I'm getting from the show okay. in this moment. Right, right, right. right? Yeah, what, the, what the lesson is going to be. And yeah. And I don't think we can really guess until we're shown what it is yeah what the result is and that's that's it's a tough thing right um but i mean we're i i would say we're both very proud of simone for figuring it out even though it is a little frustrating (laughs) neither of us wanted that to happen but uh we're glad i mean eleanor you shouldn't have left the whiteboard in the office yeah but come on simone figuring it out of course she was gonna do that i mean it's pretty surprising that the team didn't predict that that would happen because they really were spending a lot of time with that one group. <laughs> like, know. guys, could you be a little more obvious? Well, they're not going to spend time with <laughs> dumb, dumb shorts, shorts Kathy. Kathy. <laughs> what isn't my problem with her? <laughs> but, I mean, she's she's always known that there's something a little weird about this neighborhood. And if Eleanor figured it out in season one... Simone was definitely going to figure it out. (laughs) I feel like Eleanor got kind of in her own head, just like Michael did in season one. Like, 
oh, they're not going to figure this out. I'm too good for this. Like, we've got everything figured out. It's going <laughs> to run so smooth. Come on, Eleanor. <laughs> oh, come on. So on Simone's board, did you do a little bit of zooming in? A little bit. Yeah. Uh, most of it was just nothing too interesting. I like Janet's little message about potential asexuality. Yeah. That was kind of interesting. And then I wasn't sure it was like possible something identity. Hmm possible self-identity maybe not because it also said computer <laughs> uh, i like that michael's just said height and gesture yeah under eleanor it said bombastic which is another word for like pompous or exaggerating your importance uh deflective and godly question mm-hmm, mark mm-hmm. under john we had hopeful pleasantries and vanity which vanity yeah <laughs> Under Tahani, we had exceptional, accountability, and task-oriented, I think. Mm, okay. Um, Brent, we had not accountable, not respectful, asinine, which is 100%, right? But the one that I thought was most interesting was Chidi's. Um, she had accountability, tormented, well-read, educated, and then it kind of looked like there was a calendar of their time spent together. Mm. And there were all these extra notes on him, and it made me wonder... If the reason she doesn't love Chidi after a year of them being together... She sees him as a subject. Partly. I think she... I think a lot of the time that they have been together, she's been kind of studying and observing him. Instead of being herself, letting go, falling in love. Which is kind of what happened when they were together on Earth. But at the same time, she wasn't conflicted with the whole environment back on earth so no. i think she was able to relax a little bit more. a little bit more and i think there was an element of love but when chidi broke up with her when they were on earth she was kind of like okay well whatever dude i don't know you're really weird so i guess this might be for the best like she didn't seem heartbroken right and eleanor even tells him like her world is bigger than you she'll she'll move on but i think part of it is that her focus is not on romance really Mm -hmm. and even here in the good place she wasn't focused on this soulmate relationship of theirs because i think she was observing him right a lot of the time you know (laughs) yeah no that's a good point yeah so some uh some other things that were on her on her uh whiteboard were where's linda (laughs) who or what is derek (laughs) yep suspicion factors off the charts (laughs) And then she had some events listed. Pie contest. Rabbitry? Which is... Is that breeding rabbits? I don't know. Golf ball chaos. Casual strolls. Bocce tournament. Helping bugs day. (laughs) Pictionary, lake house, and ski trip. Those might have been all questionable moments that she had. Like, what's the deal with bug day? Like, why did we have a bug day? Or why were these events centered on us? Why did we only do Pictionary and not the entire neighborhood? Mm -hmm. I mean, we saw that moment. It was just these few people. Well, Pictionary Day was canceled (laughs) because of the disfigured giraffe. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. When I was watching this episode, I really felt like Eleanor, this like anxiety of how will this final day go and how in the world could I try to get more points out of these people and hopefully ensure that I win because it would be horrible to get out there and to not have won by a couple of hundred points or something. Right. Um, Squeeze every last point out of these dumb forks. (laughs) I just think... You know, after the episode before this, when we were saying, okay, it's pretty much just like Brent is never going to be redeemed. He's not the kind of person who would ever apologize. And then we get six months later and Eleanor is still wishing for something as small as oops, my bad from him. Yeah, that's not a great sign. I think it's a pretty, uh, (laughs) a pretty big neon sign in the sky that says Brent hasn't made any significant progress. Yeah. I just, Brent, you can't ruin this for all of humanity, okay? I'm not going to go to the bad place because of your crappy butt. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Well, Eleanor is showing the gang at the beginning her little little video. Mm -hmm. Um, 
they mentioned the day that everything was chocolate. No, oh, I love that. Yeah, and it, it really reminded me of a Japanese game show. Of course, <laughs> there's one okay. of those crazy Japanese game shows called Candy or Not Candy. Oh. Mm -hmm. <gasps> they put people in a room and tell them to eat objects. And right. some of the objects are chocolate or candy and some are not. <laughs> like a shoe. <laughs> Or part of the table, or the doorknob, or, you know, just the calendar. That sounds fun. I know. Until you take a bite out of a shoe, and it's just a shoe. <laughs> yeah. See, I want that as, like, an escape room, but it would be either very unsanitary. So or very unsanitary. Cost very costly. Oh, that's fun. I like that, Jason. His stupid joke that dumb joke about the Reese's, I had a peanut, Reese's butter peanut butter cup. cup and it was all chocolate oh my gosh uh, what would you want to eat if it was everything is chocolate day what well would you let's eat? just look around right now um the microphone yeah i'd just take a big old bite out of that see i think i'd want you to be chocolate <laughs> not meant to be i'm saying it would be interesting to have a jason like life-size jason chocolate that would be interesting well that's actually mentioned in a couple different shows in community i believe it's troy who's worried that if his whole head was a cookie that he'd be worried that he'd eat himself well i'd want you to be next to the chocolate you so that i knew i wasn't so there's eating two you. of me yeah well i then i know i'm not eating you so it's not a sentient I'm chocolate not, person. i'm not trying to be a cannibal okay <laughs> and then also in the simpsons homer's head turns into a donut and he starts eating himself again no cannibal inclinations here i just think it'd be fun to have a life-size chocolate version of the person I love, it would be interesting. Okay. <laughs> or myself, that would be cool. Although, I think I'd be pretty judgy. <laughs> if I'm looking a little fudgy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. That's a lot of red. <laughs> what about a uh, Kleenex box? Like, would the Kleenex sheets Ooh. be, what, like, really thin? in chocolate Ooh. or like or would it be slices of american cheese why would it be cheese <laughs> i'm just trying to think if of everything thin, is cheese day <laughs> thin foods <laughs> i guess like ham slices or something ew <laughs> not with chocolate you're gonna blow your nose it's just a piece of ham <laughs> oh gross okay It'd be very inconvenient <gasps> we're, we're off track your toilet is made out of chocolate that's gross <laughs> We are definitely okay, off we're track. We're on track. We're on track. Uh, okay. Reel it back. All right. So <laughs> right at the beginning of the episode, yep. I don't even need to mention the time jump again because we've heard my thoughts on time jumps for the past <laughs> 400 episodes. So let me sum them up. You love time jumps. You wish we could move forward every single episode. Let's talk about them for a you hot minute. You want to lose lots of time. <laughs> Just for a hot minute. In season three, we skipped several months yep. between episodes... Um, the Soul Squad was studying back on Earth. Yeah. And in season four, we've skipped six months twice. So yep. that's, <laughs> that's like a whole year that we've lost. Yeah, lost. around there. What other shows have done this? I was curious. I was thinking about this and trying mm -hmm. to figure out what other shows have jumped that significant amount of time. Yeah. And not done like flashbacks, like Lost or something like that. Like they just take the story of our main characters and we jump ahead. Yeah. So there's a few that I could think of off the top of my head. Uh, I know you haven't seen it, but 24 has done this a few times. Really? 24? Between seasons. Oh. Yes. That makes so more sense. <laughs> between seasons is kind of cheating. Like I don't mind that as much because the season is the self-contained story usually yeah. um so jumping ahead a few years is fine i think 24 did it several times like a year four years whatever i mean it's not a big deal when do they go to the bathroom on that show Every or once eat. in a while or flaw commercial breaks things happen during the commercials oh that's oh, yeah. when he's pooping oh yeah okay i mean it's 24 hours you don't have to <laughs> poop every 24 hours you can hold it if there's a crisis you can hold it 
there's more shows out there that do that i'm sure i'm i haven't seen them all um i believe crazy ex-girlfriend does this in season three mm. mm-hmm. i think it's several months go by in one episode and then they also do it in season four a bunch i think i think there are some time jumps yep yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. uh fringe definitely did this in yes. season five i think they jumped ahead like i don't know 40 50 60 years whoa something crazy that's big yeah but again it's between seasons yes so it's kind of cheating parks and rec did mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. at the end um another show you didn't watch but weeds did this a few times between seasons do you feel like this show did it do you feel like this show used those time jumps more wisely than other shows i feel like it's more necessary for this show okay because of the pace that it set for itself it's very fast yes and no okay i'm sometimes i'm not happy with it sometimes i'm okay with it how do you feel about it in this episode? Eh, I don't know. I'm just, I think I have to wait till the end of the, the show to really decide. Because it's just, there's so much that we don't get to see. And it's, this show is so much about, this season is so much about whether the set test subjects are going to become better people. Mm-hmm. And we don't get to see it happening. We just have to take their words for it. Right. So we have to see the results at the end. Like, John is clearly a little bit better. We didn't see the progression. Do we need to? Maybe not. Mm -hmm. Brent is definitely not really that much better. Or at all. Or at all. There's nothing to see there. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's it's tough to say. Yeah. I'm okay with it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm 100% okay with it. Because the test subjects are not what I come to this show for. Um, and I think it's very possible that in the next episode, we'll find out if they were really being the ones tested or if it was our original four humans, like has been predicted by a few people now. Right. But if that's the case, then wouldn't we, shouldn't we see more of our own soul squad becoming better people and going through situations which cause them to grow because the experiment's over. Yeah. We didn't we saw a couple examples of Jason, especially Jason. Yeah. Making good choices, um curbing his impulses. Impulses. Yes. yes. Um I think Tahani desiring for something more, wanting to have more impact and uh, do some work that is meaningful is uh is a good step for her. Yeah. For sure. Um, we don't get to see a lot of it from Chidi because he's not really surrounded by the four humans. But at the same time, he's made some... He makes a pretty decisive decision right at the end. Decisive decision sounds kind of silly, but you know what I mean. Um, he also... He sticks to his guns. He 100%. does. He, he immediately decides to help Brent. He doesn't yep. stop to think like, oh, what would Kant have to say about this? Or, you know, what would Hume have to say about this? Or... You know, what would Aristotle think about this situation? No, and how could this affect my relationship with Simone? Does that mean she's going to leave me? Does that mean, what does that mean? It's, right. nope, this is what I have to do. I know in this moment that who I am is the person that will be helping Brent out of this hole mm-hmm. in whatever way I possibly can. Yep. Um, Eleanor, we get to see her take leadership and become closer with people I think that's and rely what I on miss. others. Eleanor is what I miss. And I want to see her run the neighborhood. Right. Yeah. That would be fun. And Michael is still becoming a better person. So yeah, that's something. Yes. So I don't know. I'm very intrigued to see what happens. I just think that it makes the most sense to get things done here in the neighborhood as quickly as we can because now we're in the really the second half of season four and hopefully that's going to focus more on the afterlife as a whole the system the flaws in that system and what the show wants to say about the world Mm -hmm. right so i'm okay with it taking more that i'm okay with that part taking a bigger chunk of season four than just maybe a few episodes at the end, right? Right. So it's like a trade-off, you know? Yeah. If we had a 24-episode no, season, right. 
sure, go ahead. Show me, you know, John and Tani going to the fake Louvre that they made in the bad place or in the medium place, right? Yeah. But we've got 14 episodes. Let's get to the stuff that matters. Janet mentioning that she's going to be violently eating her Janet babies. <laughs> it seems important to me. Like that, that seems like something that we can't just gloss over. Mm. But they did. And we didn't see any of that, obviously. Mm-mm. I wonder if we're going to see that. Because the next episode is called Funeral to End All Funerals, I believe. Oh. So maybe that's what. The funeral is. The, it's going to be a funeral for all the the all subs, Janet all babies. the Janet babies. It's weird because in season two, to reabsorb Derek, she had to make out with him. So is she planning on making out with everyone in the neighborhood? Janet's going to... Or how is that going to work? Because she advises that no one look at her. But if Darcy Carton is just going to be making out with a bunch of people... I mean, I know Eleanor's not going to be looking away. <laughs> <laughs> Someone be, better be ready with some ice cubes because them nips are going to be hot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh it should be gross or interesting. I can't tell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh it does it does feel interesting though, like uh she's gonna be processing and It feels more like how is she will she get whatever they've learned and absorb that? Cause right. that can make her very powerful. I don't know. It's mm-hmm. interesting. Could be the equivalent of three hundred resets. Ooh. I don't know. But it just, to me, it seemed more than just a, a throwaway gag. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It also reminded me of animals that do eat their young, like hamsters. That's just weird. What's the point of reproducing if you're just going to eat your babies? I don't know. I don't get it. <laughs> the most nutritious snack? I don't know. <laughs> So what did you think of the human magic thing? Were you into that? Not into that? I think it should have been just a one thing, like a one-off. Like, I totally get Michael being enthralled with one of the fascinating aspects of humanity, magic. And wanting to do it for some reason? I don't know. But as Eleanor says, there's just magic everywhere. Yeah, but he's so endeared by know, human just... things. I mean, that's why we get a drawer full of paper clips. Yeah. You know, it's a nice callback to season one when Michael said he loves paper clips. And, and he, dumps them on Eleanor's yeah, head. He showers <laughs> Eleanor with paper clips and he makes himself a bracelet out of them. And we get Cheedy just looking at them going, what? What's up with this? You know, it's a nice callback to Michael loves human things. Mm-hmm. I think that the joke went on too long. I agree with you. I mean, he's not good at magic. I didn't really find it funny. No. But the part that I did like was Janet sassing him (laughs) when he goes, hey, can you make them clap any louder? And she says, they see what they see, man. That was a good line. That was a really good line. That was really good. That was fun. And Janet's (laughs) dress. Oh. So cool, right? So good. So cool. Yowza. It's a great... Y- yowza? <laughs> yowza. Ooh, or boffo, as Michael would say. <laughs> okay. I I made a note here, and uh, I know we've kind of gotten off Brent, but I want to get back to him for a second. Really? Who would ever want to get back to Brent? <sighs> I know, I know. I just... I don't know. I've been taken over by demons. Anyway, <laughs> Brent says he's going to put in a good word for the others, If he makes it into the best place, you know, he says, I'm going to put in a good word for you guys. If you don't make it in, you know, Um, do you guys have any business cards? (laughs) Such a great line. That was so good. I loved it. That was, Brent is a terrible person, but he's wonderfully acted. Um, Would you consider that growth for him? That he's like going to potentially help them? Oh, yeah. For sure. Yeah? Okay. Because, like, yeah, but it I might think... be for Brent. I'm saying that Brent is a terrible person, but maybe that tiny act of asking for someone else's business card so he can recommend them. I think it's more like, so he's going to forget them, but if he has business cards, it will remind him. Well, it's more like, <laughs> oh, then the person running the best place can get your contact info. Yeah. I'm not going to know. It's it. just going to say, in the bad place. 
Chidi <laughs> Anagani in the bad place. Uh, yeah, but he's not going to remember Chidi's last name. No, he won't. Does he even remember his first name? He probably Chico? calls him Chip. Chip? No. That's the no, title. No, I know. Chip Driver. Yeah, but... we can't mix up the antagonist of his story. Oh, God. Antagonist? Protagonist. Protagonist of he's his story. He's the antagonist yes. of this story. <laughs> <laughs> um, That might have been growth. Yeah. Sliver. Maybe. Sliver. So why do you think... Why do you think that they chose Brent and not someone else to go in the sinkhole? What do you think was the purpose of that? I think they explained it pretty well in the show. Okay. It had to be Brent because he's the worst. But, let me flip that on its head. If they had chosen to put someone else in the hole and Brent had saved that person, wouldn't that have earned him even more points because Absolutely. he's the worst? For sure. So shouldn't they have tried... A gambit? If they had put Simone or John in the hole, and there's Chidi, I think that Simone might have been the second best option, because we've already seen that Brent doesn't react well to Simone bossing him around. So if she's at the bottom of the hole, I mean, she would definitely still try to boss him around, but he would have two other guys who would be hopefully leading him to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And since he's a sexist pig, maybe he would be more inclined to listen to them and actually help Simone or in a damsel in distress kind of moment, help her. I don't know. I, I think they could have earned a lot of points with Brent saving someone else. I understand. Yeah. We want to make that whole point about Brent being terrible, but you still have to help terrible people right. when they're in a life or death type of situation i'm just saying playing devil's advocate i guess whatever i don't know what that means on this show that they could have had brent try to save somebody and earned equal if not more points in theory absolutely yeah. but i don't think it would play out that way okay if simone was in the hole mm-hmm. Cheedy would volunteer first to save okay. her immediately. Yeah. He would be like, we got to save her. And Brent agreeing wouldn't be that big of a deal. Like, I don't think that would get him that many points. He'd be like, okay, let's all help pull the rope, whatever. I don't think that's a big deal. If Chidi was in the hole, I think Simone would go to help him immediately. And again, I believe Brent would just be like, okay, I'll can, I can help. And I don't think, it, again, it would be a big deal. What about John? I don't think he would help. No? Um, I think I think that would be that would be tough because I believe Chidi would, Chidi and Simone would both volunteer to pull him out. And I think the yeah. situation would still play out the same way with Brent being like, okay, I can grab on the end of the rope and tug as well. So do Brent's motivations account for a lot of it, do you think? I think he would just be doing it because they're doing it. Okay, so his motivation could he either be... He wouldn't want to look bad by walking away. Right. So it would, get, again, be about himself. Mm, yeah, and about securing his spot in the best place, potentially. Yeah. Oh, that's tough. It is tough, because yeah. maybe he would jump in first and be like, I can help, but we already discussed that in the last episode with uh, Eleanor saying, well, maybe we... Or, Jason saying, well, maybe we can, you know, set someone's... We can set my robe on fire. Yeah, maybe set my robe on out. fire. Yeah. Exactly. So I just, I don't think any of those situations would play out the way they wanted them to. I mean, this yeah. didn't play out the way they wanted it to, no, so... No, no. And yet, I yeah, I get what you're saying, because having Brent outside of the sinkhole is probably the riskier option. Yeah. 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 Oh, boy. <laughs> Um, now, Simone and John escape, but how do they even know that they can escape? They don't. Like, where do they go? Because in the first season, Eleanor knew that she could take the train somewhere else because she had seen people from the bad place come in on the train. These humans have never seen another neighborhood. Right. So, the so how fact do they that... know that there's any, literally anything? It could just be void. Yeah. Once you get out of the neighborhood. There's a flaw in their plan because Janet says, oh, yeah, they'll have enough time to save Chidi, call me to get a train. And then that's the point. Like, they don't know about a train. Why would they call Janet to get a train? Nobody. I know there's a train station. 
but maybe they don't know if it works or if it yeah, just goes around just, the neighborhood. Right. Like maybe it's just for looks. Disney World type train. Yeah, exactly. Never been to Disney World, but you know. <laughs> like a monorail <laughs> that just goes around. Yeah. The, right. So that might have been one of their biggest flaws, like assuming that the group knows about the trains mm -hmm. and that there's anywhere else to go. Mm hmm. Maybe they could guess that there are other neighborhoods, but yeah, it hasn't been really explicitly explained to them. So where are they going to drive, right? I don't know. Are they going to end up seeing Mindy's house? That's... Ah! So anyway. how long has it been? It's been 10 minutes since they left. So Something like that. you think they could drive to Mindy's in 10 minutes? Probably. probably. Yeah, probably. Oh, maybe that'll get Mindy back into the season for a little bit. Could be interesting. <laughs> I think we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the cackle. We can chat about the cackle. Oh my god. I was that... disappointed with the cackle. <laughs> At first I loved it. This is an auditory medium, so you don't know that I am like mouth agape unbelieving of what Jason is saying right now. I what? know. Like as soon as I saw it the first time, I, was, I loved it. Oh. But rewatching it a few times, it's so forced. Oh, Her reaction. Oh, disagree. It, just, it felt so fake. And like, I don't know. Michael's was still legit great. Yeah. But it just, like, he leans into her and then she cackles. And and then she says, oh, they figured it out. Like, it just feels fake. And I don't like, I didn't like it. Oh. Okay, I totally disagree with you. Yeah. Eleanor says the exact same thing that Michael says at the end of season one. Mm -hmm. Oh man, I can't believe you figured it out. But she says it in a meaner way, which I really liked. Because season one, yeah, that moment is iconic. It always will be. Um, but Michael hadn't had any of that rehearsed, right? He wasn't expecting to do it. So that idea that like Eleanor's is a little forced is fine with me. Mm -hmm. um, because it is. She's acting. Right. And not only that, she is confirming that she has been torturing the person that she loves the most. He's sitting right in front of her and mm -hmm. she's saying, yeah, I'm actually not what you thought I was. I'm, I'm torturing you. Yeah. And I think that would be hard for her. Plus, I really like that she goes in this more like evil direction instead of like a, oh man, I can't believe you figured it out. And now like, I'm going to go sit over here and toss this like actually little, frustrated. this little plant off a shelf, you know, like right. I'm a frustrated cat. You've just bothered. She is kind of like almost impressed with them in that moment. I think it's great. I love that. I mm. think it's so fun. I like that Michael lets her have the lead, um, which is very like Ted Danson giving Kristen Bell the lead there. Uh, I felt like he was this, Really proud demon dad okay, in this yeah, moment. Yeah, I can see that for sure. Um, and I think it must have been just so much fun for them to do. Yes. Plus, I just, I don't think I can get over that initial feeling of, oh my God, oh my God, they're doing it again. Oh my God, they're doing it again. The and then it happened. Yeah. And I was just stunned in that total shock moment. and awe. It yeah. Was. So I'm glad that they did it again. I think it was totally worth it. And... So much fun to watch. So much fun. Maybe I'll be a bit more appreciative of it, watching it in a different way. Like yeah. the fact that Eleanor is putting on a bit of a show and kind of just forcing it. Yeah. Because I, they need, she, I mean, their time fun, is running out. She's... So they know they have to get through it. Yeah. As quickly as possible. Yeah. And still be convincing. Yes. Right? Very yes. Very much so. Um, plus, man, that laugh would be hard to do. Yes. I really think it would be very hard to stand next to Ted Danson and do that laugh. Oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that just amusing, angry, disbelieving, the whole mix of it. Oh, it's so good. So overall, did you enjoy this episode? I did. It has one of my favorite Tahani lines. Oh, really? It does. <laughs> In the words of Princess Kate after we came back from our shopping trip in Ibiza, there's a lot to unpack here. <laughs> I don't know why, but it just, it, it fits really well in the scenario, even though she took the longest way to get there. As Eleanor would say, oh, thank you for taking the longest, you know, the shortest way to get to this. <laughs> but 
I just love it. It's just so unnecessarily accurate. (laughs) And they're talking about two different things. We're talking about information, unpacking, and they're done. She's talking about shopping. Of course. I just, I love it. Tahani's pretty great. Yeah. 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 (laughs) And saying that they could all work the the coat check at the Met Gala. Mm-hmm. Um, I think one of my favorite lines is from John when <laughs> when he's just so weirded out and annoyed by Chidi and Simone's pet names, and he's like, <laughs> "Oh, you call her Muffin? Oh, I'm getting a lot of breaking news at once here. Like, <laughs> I need to sit down. <laughs> he's just so <sighs> he's so sassy and like." He's just got this awful attitude that I think is really funny. Speaking of John. Cutting. He's very cutting. I think my favorite thing to do for the past few episodes or when we do another rewatch is going to be just watching his reactions in the background because he's really great at just, you know, continuously acting in scenes. Like He's a good reactor. He is a great reactor and... On his face, when he's just struggling in to keep Jason's secret, it's just, <laughs> you can tell he's just ready to burst. He just can't wait. He, he can't keep it in anymore. It's it's relevant AF now. <laughs> and uh, later on, when Brent gets called up to be Michael's assistant for the magic mm. show, Brent hands John his drink to hold, and John just looks at him, and he's just looking around like, WTF, bro? Like, why did why? you? What? Why couldn't you take your drink with you? Yeah, it was just really fun to watch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's a uh, he's not the best person, obviously, um, but he's a great actor. Yes, great actor for sure. Diving into our mail bag, just ruffling around in there, we got a couple of juicy tidbits. <laughs> um, we had a we had a Twitter message from Jan M. A couple weeks ago that we forgot to bring up. And I apologize, Jan. Um, Jan says, I was listening to you talk about the bad green screen in Employee of the Barony, And I noticed it too. But I felt it was on purpose. The whole feel of the show is very fake. Because it is. The Good Place Town looks like a film set. Because it really is a fake world. The train background is fake. Because it's not in the actual world. There's a big contrast between the afterlife world. And when they were on Earth in season 3. And I I guess I kind of agree that part of it is just kind of, it's fake, so it's okay to look fake. Mm -hmm. And part of me is, that's kind of a poor excuse. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Okay. I don't know. I, I, I know where you're, I get where you're coming from. And I partially agree. Yeah, I can see it as a, as a good reasoning for it after. Yeah, when it when it takes you out of the scene at the moment and like something emotional is happening on screen or, you know, Tahani and Eleanor are having this conversation that's kind of important, but then all you can think about is they don't really look like they're there. <laughs> or something like, you know, when Jason is on the pump car and he's, you know, chatting about Blake Bortles and it looks fake. I don't know. I think that it would have to be more obviously fake for me to feel more comfortable. Right. Um, Similar to what we had last season in the IHOP. It was obviously green screen. There is nowhere in the world that is like that place with the blue and Mm -hmm. greeny kind of background and all that. If it was so obviously fake then I think I would feel more comfortable. Right. But when it is attempting to look like reality, like it's but just it's a desert. just a little off. It's mm-hmm. that kind of uncanny valley feel. Absolutely. Um, but I honestly, I appreciate the way you've rationalized it because mm-hmm. I think that's fun. You know, I like being able to do stuff like that too. It's, yeah. Explaining around the detail. <laughs> you know, sometimes you just got to do that. And I, yeah. I appreciate it. Thank no, you, Jan. That's, that's smart. <laughs> Good stuff. Thanks for your message, Jan. Apologies for getting to it so late. (laughs) Our next message comes from Max Veiling at Dreadful Gate on Twitter. He says, So do you think that Brent's redemption, or lack thereof, will be what makes or breaks the experiment? 
What if they manage to improve Brent, but only at the cost of making everyone else worse? What if that tips the scales for the worse? Oh boy. Yeah. Yeah, So this is kind of my issue. And I brought it up a little bit earlier this episode is that we spend so much time focusing on how to improve Brent and how the other people can help Brent become a better person and all this stuff. But it's possible that we're not spending the appropriate amount of time on each individual person because Brent sucks so much of the air out of the room. Right. It's like when you're at school in a classroom and there's just one student that is so obnoxious and always gets in trouble and the teacher always has to spend all their time with him and everybody else suffers for it. Yeah. And that's kind of how I feel about Brent. I'm concerned that he will be the one that breaks this experiment even though we do see him beginning an apology in this episode um and it's it's scary to think that other people may be come worse i know that there are some people online who really disapprove of the way that simone and john reacted and they feel that they're inherently bad people now i disagree with those people Um, but it's sad to think that Simone and John maybe are losing a whole bunch of points because they didn't help him Mm -hmm. after he's been horrible to them. So then that would kind of screw up Eleanor's redemption if she got it because she put him in that position. She kind of threw Brent in the sinkhole. Yeah. Threw him under the bus. Yeah. I mean... Michael came up with the idea and everybody else went along with it. Yeah. So they trusted him in that moment. <sighs> That's a tough one. It is. Yeah, I'm I'm with you, Max, here. I'm very I'm very worried. <laughs> Max also says about Brent, he's so used to being the center of of attention all his life and even now. What he needs to learn is he's just some guy. Hey, maybe Mindy St. Clair can teach him that. I'd love to see her play a part in saving humanity. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the smile on B's face right now. <laughs> All right. I'm excited about that idea because Mindy is not a great person. We've seen that she's not great, but she's still better than Brent is. So it would be interesting to see her kind of no nonsense approach to Brent and see how she could help him. Right. If, we do, in fact, get to see Mindy again in this season if we kind of bring her back with perhaps Simone and John going to her place. I think that would be a fun way to get her involved in the season again. Yeah, I could see her putting Brent in his place. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, she would have sex with Brent. Gross. Yeah. She would totally have sex with Brent. Yeah. Nasty. Um, well, you can't be too choosy when you live alone, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Well, you you can be, you can be. Be choosy. Don't ever have sex with a Brent. Okay. Thanks for your message, Max. Thank you. Uh, we also got a Twitter message from Lexi. Um, at underscore Lex underscore icon underscore. <laughs> Lexi mentions a couple things that we brought up um, about Simone's board. Mm. The where is Linda and the who <laughs> or what is Derek. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Who or what is Derek? We'd all like to know that. Yeah, he's... uh... I think he's probably got a lot more Jason Mantzoukas in him than we'd like to admit. (laughs) And Lexi also says, Chidi seems to have only loved Simone because he thought she was his soulmate. Chidi gave up his relationship with Eleanor to save everyone and was heartbroken. Chidi gave up his relationship with Simone to save Brent. And as John pointed out, the breakup was boring. So maybe... uh... I don't know. That's tough. Like, did Chidi really care about her or was it just he felt like he had to care about her because Eleanor said that she was his soulmate? Well, I think we we've already seen him have feelings for her in a different life, right? Different setting, different circumstances. They have a lot of things in common in the sense that they're both academics. They're both, you know, very uh, educated people. They're both thoughtful people. Mm -hmm. Um they, you know, share a lot of the same opinions, even if they don't behave in the same way. Right. Um, but their relationship grew naturally on Earth. Their relationship did grow naturally on Earth, and it was a little bit more forced in the afterlife, for sure. I, I think there's still a million things that Chidi loved about her. Mm-hmm. 
But I think it was definitely intensified by this idea that she was his one. Right. She was the one for him. Yeah. Um, and he had never had a one on A Earth. certainty like that. Yeah. So I think, I think there's different intensities. I don't think that he didn't care for her or only cared for her because she was his soulmate or so he thought. Yeah, I think a lot of that also is because he's got a lot to think about at the moment. He doesn't really have time to process those feelings about his relationship when his afterlife is at stake. Like, yeah. it's his whole... And he, I mean, he does make a couple of jokes, too. Like, well, I really want that to be true. If he didn't like Simone, but he felt like she was his soulmate, I think it would be pretty easy for him to be like, well, yeah, maybe soulmates don't exist <laughs> because I hate her. Mm -hmm. um, and then he does make a couple of jokes saying, well, I don't want my heart to break. And, uh, you know, I, I, I really want... You know, all everything that Eleanor said to be true because it really, it's important to me and we don't have to worry about that right now because no one's heart needs to break right at this moment. So I think he really does care about Simone. I just think that fundamentally they're not able to agree on really big things and mm -hmm. that's going to keep them apart. Yep. So I don't know. And it'll be interesting to see how things go because... John's the one who says this is a breakup, but did they really break up? Right. Or maybe it was just a little bit of a fight and they both need to sit down and talk about their Brent situation and <laughs> their thoughts about <laughs> philosophy and maybe they just need to hash it out. It's a very stressful situation, guys. It is. It is. It is. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Lexi, for your message. The new episode's already out. This is very late for us to get this one out. Apologies. We haven't watched it, so we have no idea... If anything we're saying is true or not. It's been very hard not to watch the next episode. We have been, it's been very stressful. carefully browsing the internet. Very carefully. Trying not to be spoiled. Um, we absolutely didn't want to watch the episode until we recorded this. And um, colds are awful. Yeah, don't the get flu colds, is terrible. Guys. I don't know. Don't get sick. Take Wash echinacea. your hands. Get a flu shot. Take echinacea. If you want to be reminded to take Echinacea like 12 times a day, move in with Jason. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Just take some Echinacea. And It'll get better. C. <laughs> and vitamin C. Okay. So this has been Forking Bullshirt, a Multiverse Radio production. If you are a fan of our show, please leave us a rating and a review on iTunes. I mean, the show is free and it's ad free. If you like it, help us out, guys. Um, tell your friends, your neighbors, your uh, Brents of the world. Actually, don't tell them. I don't like them. I don't want them listening to me. If you want to join the conversation, we're on Twitter at Multiverse Radio and Facebook at Multiverse Radio Podcast. Please use the hashtag FBullshirt if you got some thoughts to share with us. And you can email us directly at info at multiverseradio.ca. That's us. We're the info. Yes. You, we have all your info right here in this podcast. Info me, info you. <laughs> I'm Vivian. And I'm Jason. Thanks so much for listening. Bye. Bye. And they have not been a very good person. Sometimes they stomp around upstairs. A lot. Like really loudly. Except he's not homeless. He's literally in our house. <laughs> um, Hold on. I'm just saying, maybe <laughs> up your fiber intake next season. Or maybe if he realizes, <laughs> like, hey, this is going to be a tough day. Let's take, you know, a stool hardener and just make sure I don't have to go. Wow. You think Special Jack Agent Jack Bauer would absolutely, <laughs> you know, stick a cork in it for a day. <laughs> Kicking down doors to the bathroom stalls. <laughs> <laughs> Terrorists better be in this fucking.
fucking push the throne, I'm telling you! Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there's another <laughs> there's another couple shows or maybe he puts a diaper on <laughs> His family. Okay, yeah, that's sad. Yeah, that's not great. <laughs> Maybe I'll get more appreciated, appreciative of it, looking at it as a bit, at a bit different, in a bit different, in a different way. Do you want to try that it. whole sentence all over again? 